Coming up on Arirang News. President Yoon expresses his resolve to actively reform four sectors, including the National Pension Scheme, and tackle the chronically low birth rate that cuts across all areas of society. After a series of defaked sex crimes sparked public outrage, the government and the ruling PPP aim to toughen punishments for such crimes and have a hotline with Telegram where this illegal content has been circulated. Israel carried out a large-scale operation in the occupied West Bank for two straight days on Thursday, killing at least five more militants, including a well-known local commander in an Islamic Jihad militant group. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. I'm Kim bo -kyang. We begin with the president's policy briefing and press conference with local and foreign media earlier today, where he emphasized his core policy agendas, the so-called 4 plus 1 reforms. The main focus was on the national pension. Our correspondent Oh Seung has the details. President Yoon Song yeol expressed his resolve against resistance to actively reform the national pension scheme, medical service, education and labor sector for the future of the country. This came in his policy briefing and press conference Thursday, which focused on the so-called 4 plus 1 reforms to fundamentally enhance South Korea's quality of life and productivity. Kayokwajongunda. 저는 쉬운 길을 가지 않겠습니다. Pension reform was the foremost agenda ahead of the government's soon to be released roadmap for the national pension scheme as South Korea's rapidly aging society faces the possible depletion of pension funds by 2055. The president called for the country's law to include the guarantee that pension payouts would be made. South Korea having the world's lowest birth rate and a declining population means fewer young people will have to support the disproportionately large number of pensioners. Previous discussions in Parliament have focused on parametric measures, such as adjusting the insurance premium rate, how much you pay, and how much of your income can be replaced by your pension payout, or the income replacement rate. However, Yoon clearly showed his administration will aim for a structural reform to the national pension scheme, mentioning an automatic adjustment system for premium rates and income replacement levels based on economic and demographic conditions. He also raised the need to set different timelines for the younger and older generation to meet the increase in premium payments, as well as enhancing benefits for military personnel and new mothers to make up for gaps in their premium contributions. Amid the months-long protest by trainee doctors and medical professors on expanding the number of medical students, the president renewed his pledge to fundamentally strengthen the healthcare system nationwide, especially in hospitals and non-capital areas, by increasing the number of doctors and improving compensation schemes. On education, Yoon promised to deliver a public care system to ease the burden of childbearing for working parents. On labour, he further pledged efforts to create a virtuous cycle of innovative growth for firms and quality work environments for workers through labour market flexibility and fair compensation that meets global standards. And cutting across all areas, Yun reiterated his commitment to raising the chronically low birth rate by improving the work-life balance for young South Koreans and dedicating a new ministry to handling urgent demographic issues that affect education, healthcare, employment, housing and welfare. As he takes the road not taken to achieve the 4 plus 1 reforms, Yoon asked for cooperation from Parliament and the public support to create a fair and sustainable future for the country. Oh Soo Young, Arirang News. In the meantime, next year's budget for foreign affairs sector will likely be focused on South Korea increasing its contributions on the global stage and more. 
Our foreign affairs correspondent Pei has the details. The foreign ministry unveiled the details of its budget proposal for next year on Thursday, saying that it plans to focus spending on hosting the APEC summit, increasing official development assistance, and providing more funding to international organizations. In total, the ministry seeks to spend around 4.3 trillion Korean won next year, or about 3.2 billion U.S. dollars. That's around a 3 percent increase compared to this year. This includes a budget of more than 100 billion Korean won, or nearly $74 million, to further prepare for the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit that will be held in November next year in Gyeongju City in the southeast. The proposed amount is nearly 40 times higher than this year's budget of 2.5 billion won. Next year's APEC summit will mark the first time in 20 years that South Korea is holding the event, after the country hosted it back in 2005 in Busan. As for its spending on official development assistance, the ministry set aside 2.8 billion Korean won, which is a little more than 2 billion U.S. dollars. That's around 2 percent higher compared to last year. In line with the country's vision to become a global pivotal state, it also seeks to raise its contributions to international organizations. It has proposed to spend 826 billion Korean won, or nearly $620 million in this field, up 15 percent from this year's spending. Also, the ministry allocated 6.9 billion Korean won to prepare for the South Korea Central Asia Summit that is planning to host next year. It explained that this event is in line with the country's so-called K-Silk Road initiative laid out when President Yoon suk yeol visited three Central Asian countries in June. Pae eun Arirang News. The government plans to expand support for private sector radio broadcasts to North Korea as part of its efforts to provide North Korean residents with more information about the outside world. The Unification Ministry on Thursday stressed the importance of expanding North Koreans' rights to access information, which comes in line with South Korea's revised August 15th Doctrine on Unification. Specifically, the ministry said it will support content production and human resource development. It also emphasized that the ministry would help North Koreans recognize the value of freedom and work toward unification. A special strike operation drill involving South Korean and U.S. forces took place over a period of five days in Gwangju, Gyeonggi-do province. The drill, including American aerial assets, sought to bolster offensive strike capabilities and to master advanced combat skills before wrapping up this past Wednesday. The latest training came on the sidelines of the Ulti Freedom Shield, which ended on this Thursday morning. Plus, Hall and Washington's combined outdoor exercises will continue until mid-September. Recently, a series of deepfake crimes involving minors and ordinary citizens sparked public outcry. And in response, the government and ruling party are looking to raise the maximum prison sentence for those who commit such crimes and establish a hotline with Telegram where illegal content is circulated. Our political correspondent Shin ha shares the details. Fears rise as digital sex crimes using sexually explicit deepfake images are spreading widely across the country, resulting in numerous victims. According to a survey conducted by the Korean Teachers and Education Workers Union over the last two days, over 500 of nearly 2,500 students and staff reported experiencing either direct or indirect harm from deepfake crimes. However, the issue is believed to be more severe than the numbers indicate. Among numerous chat rooms on Telegram suspected of deepfake criminal activities, one room with an estimated 220,000 members was discovered, prompting the police to launch an investigation. Victims included military personnel. In response to the rise in deepfake crimes, the government and ruling party on Thursday have agreed to strengthen penalties for those who make or send such content. People may misuse deepfake technology, but they also have the ability to stop it. This problem needs to be solved through laws and systems. People Power Party policy chief Kim Sang-un told reporters that the government plans to increase the maximum sentence for producing and distributing fake images or videos from the current five years to seven years, aligning it with a penalty for illegal recording. 
They are also working on establishing a hotline with Telegram to better deal with the issue of illegal content given the difficulties in cooperation due to overseas servers. The two sides are also considering creating a control tower within the Office for Government Policy Coordination to oversee and coordinate the response to deepfake crimes. Referring to recent deepfake abuse cases where many offenders were found to be law-breaking minors and thus under the recognized age for without criminal responsibility, PPP leader Han Dong-un emphasized the need for a bipartisan agreement to widen the age threshold for law-breaking minors to cover those aged between 10 and 14. Currently, they are subject to protective disposition after committing a crime rather than punishment. Shin ha Arirang News. The leader of the ruling People Power Party, Han Dong-hun, and his counterpart from the main opposition Democratic Party, Lee Jae-myung, will hold their first official talks on the first day of September. The two were originally set to have talks last Sunday, but the DP leader testing positive for COVID-19 resulted in a postponement. The meeting will be in 3 plus 3 format, with each party's top policymaker and spokesperson present, and only up until the opening remarks will be broadcast live. If Han and Yi meet this Sunday at the National Assembly, it will be the first agenda talks between rival party chiefs since 2013. Over in Japan, millions in the southern region have been urged to evacuate as Typhoon Chanshan made landfall on Kyushu Island's Kagoshima Prefecture on Thursday morning. The Japan Meteorological Agency issued an emergency warning saying it could be one of the strongest storms ever to hit the region. More than 210,000 households in Kagoshima and around 16,000 in Miyazaki lost electricity. A house collapsed, leaving three people dead in Miyagi Prefecture due to unexpected downpours. Damage to buildings has been reported in prefectures under evacuation orders. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, Israel continues its offensives in Palestine as it launched a major military incursion into the occupied West Bank. The Israeli military said on Thursday its troops killed five Palestinian fighters who were hiding inside a mosque. One of them is allegedly a Palestine Islamic Jihad agent responsible for multiple terror attacks against Israelis. The attacks, which began early Wednesday, started as Israeli troops raided the northern region of the West Bank, such as the cities of Tukharam, Jenin, and areas in the Jordan Valley. This is said to be one of the largest assaults on the occupied territory, with at least 16 Palestinians killed. Israel has stated that this comes to root out a terror infrastructure. Back in South Korea, arrest warrants have been issued for two people being held responsible for a fire at a lithium battery plant in June that left 23 dead. The CEO of the company was the first to be arrested for violating the Serious Accidents Punishment Act. An Sung Jin explains in detail. The owner of the lithium battery factory where a deadly blaze left 23 dead in June has been arrested. Suwon District Court issued a warrant for CEO Park Sung Wan on Wednesday, citing the severity of the charges of safety violations. This is the first time for a company owner to be arrested under the Serious Accidents Punishment Act. The act, which went into effect in 2022, was put in place to ensure safety at workplaces. Park has also been accused of employing illegal migrant workers. His son, who is the general manager of the company, was also arrested under warrant for employing the workers without safety training and switching quality inspection samples before supplying the batteries to the military. The arrest warrants were issued after a substantive 14-hour examination began on Wednesday on evidence against four people associated with the fatal fire. The court dismissed requests for warrants for the company's safety and health management manager and the owner of the manpower company that provided the legal workers. It stated that there was no risk of destruction of evidence or risk of the two leaving the country. The CEO refused to comment on the charges of failing to provide safety education and not paying the workers. Though Park has been arrested, the families of the victims are still left with anger and sorrow. <laughs> Don't 
타격증 까지 얻어가지고 한국당에 왔습니다. 그런데 5월 6월 24일 날 이렇게 짜릿짜릿 목숨을 벗어 갔습니다. The emergency authorities stated that the fire was exacerbated by a rush to meet a supply deadline and a failure to respond to signs of risky quality effects in the batteries. An Song Jin, Arirang News. Most hospital workers, including nurses, have canceled their plan for collective action after sealing last-minute wage deals with their respective hospitals. The Korean Health and Medical Workers Union, whose members work at 62 medical entities nationwide, were scheduled to stage a strike starting today, aggravating concerns over health care amid the prolonged walkout by doctors in training. Out of the 62 medical entities under the union, 59 have suspended their strike plan, having successfully addressed wage hikes and work boundaries in the absence of doctors. This latest development also follows Wednesday's parliamentary approval of a bill that provides legal basis for physician assistant nurses to perform certain procedures under legal protection. A growing number of people in South Korea's rural areas are having difficulty accessing food. Our correspondent Lee Soo Jin tells us about the business model being used to address the problem. It's early in the morning, but this supermarket manager's day has already begun. He's busy adding items into a cart at a supermarket in a rural area of Pocheon City in northern Gyeonggi-do province. Many of the areas residents are living in what is called a food desert, where people have limited access to healthy and affordable food. The groceries are loaded into this mobile supermarket truck named Happy Market, which will head to food deserts in the area. Many villages lack even basic stores, and food deserts are increasing as businesses avoid or fail in areas with declining populations and low purchasing power. Data from the Agriculture Ministry shows that more than 73 percent of rural communities nationwide are food deserts. And for most residents of these rural communities, mainly senior citizens, buses are their only mode of transportation. The interval for cheaper buses is around 30 minutes, so if you end up missing one, it'll take around 40 minutes just to get to a store. He says that all three corner stores that used to be in the village are now gone. Independent Leon corner stores were unable to make a profit. This was the last one, but it also closed down. This is why residents regard Happy Market as an oasis in a food desert, particularly since it visits three villages daily, Monday to Friday. Inside the truck are groceries that residents order just by texting the manager, ranging from snacks to flour and fruits. But for the elderly, the most valuable service is the manager's doorstep delivery, a rare luxury in food deserts without access to standard delivery options, a reality that's hard to believe in the age of quick commerce. This makes life easier for old people like me. I'm always very thankful. While it can be challenging, especially in the heat, the manager says it's worth it. I now know most of the elders. They're like family to me. And it's this sentiment that creates an effective food oasis business model. With South Korea's food desert dilemma expected to worsen due to its aging population, mobile trucks like this will hopefully soon be available to all those needing them. Lee Soo Jin, Arirang News. On the cultural front, a unique musical journey is taking place here in Korea, where an audience can enjoy music from around the world. Our E&E met with artists performing cross-cultural music. Nodil Island in Seoul's Yongsangu district is the place to be for anyone looking to take a global musical journey. Co-hosted by the Korea Foundation and the Embassy of Colombia in Korea, the 2024 Public Diplomacy Rhapsody, Vibe Voyage, held on August 28th and 29th, 
brings together artists and music from all around the world. If you're interested in cross-cultural sounds, you won't want to miss this two-day event. With artists from Colombia, Morocco, Egypt, Pakistan and South Korea, the concert provides a unique opportunity to enjoy diverse musical traditions. Tal is an experimental music group that reinvents Pakistan's Kawali, a form of Islamic devotional singing rooted in Sufi traditions by blending it with Korean folk music. We wanted to give the audience a sense of traveling, even though we're here at Lodur Island in Seoul. By listening to their music, we hope the audience will explore new cultures. His voice was really nice. Yes, it's a voice that kind of gives you joy and makes you hype. Yeah, and we try to dance a little bit. <laughs> Next up, the journey heads to Africa. Dressed in traditional Moroccan attire, the band Omar and Eastern Power features members from South Korea, Morocco and Egypt. Our band has a distinctive sound that we believe is truly unique, and this is a major source of our strength. The blend of different cultural backgrounds within our group comes across in our music, giving us a powerful edge. Salsa and Groove, with their adventurous Colombian sounds, blends Cuban, Latin American, and classic salsa with electronic elements. Our music preserves the spirit and roots of traditional styles, while also conveying a message of innovation and change. For the audience, it's a chance to connect with and appreciate each other's cultures. And she told me, like, there's like this. Uh, this festival where there's gonna be a Colombian and do you want to go with me and I said yes because at the end it's like even if the country is different I'm able to get a connection with Latin roots and everything while I listen to a lot of mainstream music it's not easy to find these kinds of unique sounds elsewhere it's a pleasure to discover new music and engage with so many cultures five voyage shows that despite varying melodies rhythms and musical roots music can transcend borders Ian Hee, Arirang News. Typhoon Hansan has made landfall in Japan, but Korea is also experiencing different weather in the west and east due to the direct and indirect effects of typhoon. There's a place in the distant sea of the South Sea of Korea where a typhoon warning has been issued. The waves can be as high as 6 meters in the East Sea, South Sea, and waters off Jeju Island, so please refrain from approaching the coast. On the other hand, inland areas are experiencing a heat wave. With heat wave warnings in effect in most parts of the country except the East Coast, hot weather will continue. The typhoon, which landed on the west coast of Kyushu, Japan, will slowly penetrate Japan until Monday. Tomorrow will start off at 24 degrees Celsius in Seoul, Daejeon, and Gwangju. It will move up to 33 in Seoul and Chuncheon, Daejeon, and Gwangju, 34 degrees. This heat in the western parts of the country caused by easterly winds will continue until the weekend. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world. That's all we have for today. Thank you for watching. Arirang News will be back at 9 a.m. Korea time.